This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Chair of the Waste Energy Committee, who is the sponsor of this particular event, the Energy Seminar, which has two, or probably more than two functions on campus. One of them, this is a class, and those of you who are registered for it will clearly know as such. Um, but the second and important function of the Energy Seminar is to bring together people across campus who are working or interested in energy. So um, I'm very glad that you all found your way here. The uh, program for the coming quarter will be posted in at least two places. One of them is on the Woods Energy Institute site. It, it, it is already there, I checked before I came. And for students who are registered in 301, Energy 301 or Civil and Environmental Engineering 301, can also find that program on the coursework website for 301. Now, students who are registered in 301, if you haven't done that before, let me remind you of the requirements for the one unit of credit that's available for the class. You have to do two things, or really ten things. One of them is to attend all of the seminars, except you get one get out of jail free card, okay? You can miss one. Uh, it's therefore important, and I please encourage you to do this, please sign the attendance list that will circulate during the class. Uh, and for anybody else, whether you are signed up for 301 or not, if you would like your email address to be put on our mailing list, you can also sign that attendance list that it circulates, and we will make sure that you hear a future events. The, the other thing that students register in 301 need to do is to write a paper on one of the <coughs> it doesn't have to be particularly long, and it's your choice of which seminar you choose to write on. All of that is explained also on the coursework website. Um, so anyway, let's move to today's seminar. We're very pleased to uh, welcome Elton Sherwin, who is Senior Managing Director of Redfoot Capital, which is a venture capital firm uh, close by. Um, I hesitate to tell you when, what his education included, but he in fact graduated from uh, UC Berkeley <laughs> and subsequently worked for quite some time in both Motorola and IBM before moving into the VC world. So his particular interest or topic today is on federal policy and how it applies to public health. Okay. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Real pleasure to be here. So uh, I work for a private equity or VC firm that invests in energy-related things, energy tech, renewable energy projects, and uh, offshore natural gas in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I'm also working on a, uh, a book, um, tentatively we're calling it something like What You Can Do About Global Warming, and it's targeted at a general American audience with the things that individuals can do around their houses, uh, easy projects, hard projects, expensive projects. And I'm trying out all of these on my wife, who's just thrilled with this project. Uh, <clears throat> and then at night, writing up the notes on how well or how less well the particular project went and what my children thought about having all their notebooks go into hibernate mode when they leave uh, and uh, go have dinner. I also have a, a chapter that I'm working on called What the President Needs to Do, and then one for Arnold called What the Governor Needs to uh, Do. And when I got uh, the note last week that uh, there was an opening to speak, um, I was in Washington, had just uh, met with some uh, friends at the Department of Energy, and so it just seemed appropriate to whip together the outline for that particular chapter. So today I'm going to talk about the federal policy, what I believe our objectives as a nation need to be, a brief overview of the risks to America, because to some extent how you assess the risk uh, cause you to formulate uh, various different, make various different policy choices, and then talk about what I refer to as a simple, but as you'll see, quite controversial eight-point plan um, for a uh, federal action plan really to uh, save the world from climate change. So um, this presentation has not been seen by anyone else. It hasn't been endorsed by anyone. And in terms of full disclosure, I have many investments that will be affected by uh, global warming. 
so I'm not a disinterested party in this topic. So what are our policy objectives or what should they be as a nation? Um, obviously, um, the primary one is to create a safe climate for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. Uh, I think there's an increasing agreement that another one degree uh, Celsius uh, probably defines the upper limit of what is considered safe. I think you can still find a few people that think that two to three degrees is acceptable, um, but there's an increasing consensus that one degree is, uh, is enough. Um, uh, that's probably wrong. Um, we're probably already too warm. Uh, we're probably already doing too much damage to uh, Greenland and to the, uh, the Arctic North. So we need to craft a policy that gives us some freedom here that can uh, keep uh, temperature rise to a degree and has the ability to actually freeze temperature or even roll it back. The last time we probably knew for sure that we had a safe temperature on Earth was probably um, in the 1970 time frame. And this is going to, uh, by anyone's arithmetic, cause us to have to phase out traditional coal-fired power plants uh, worldwide. And a major objective of American policy has to be to do this by mid-century. Um, we need to reduce our carbon footprint uh, as individuals in America uh, by at least 75% and maybe as high as, as 90%. There are a couple of interesting side effects of that. Um, we regain energy independence about halfway down the road to doing that. We actually become an oil exporting country. Um, we have to do this without raising gasoline taxes. Raising gasoline taxes is like raising bread taxes and governments get overthrown. So we have to craft a policy um, that doesn't require us or for that matter the Chinese to have to increase fuel taxes for individual vehicles. We need to do it in a way that uh, we continue to have a growing economy. Simultaneously with what we need to do, um, the Indians and the Chinese and some other governments are going to try and pull one to two billion people around the world out of poverty. And as you pull people out of poverty, their lives become more energy intense. Um, so we need to craft a policy that, that enables that to happen. And of course, we need to have a policy that ensures uh, dramatic changes in China, because you'll see in a minute we can't do this without the Chinese. And finally, we want to be cognizant of Occam's razor. That is, we want to pursue the simplest, uh, the most minimally sufficient solution that we can that, um, that stops climate change. So let's talk for a moment about the risks. So as you may have heard, about 90% or more of the world's glaciers are shrinking. Um, those of us who live in states without much glacier ice probably don't worry too much about that. Um, but it is troubling, and it's particularly troubling in the Himalayas. Um, the uh, Himalayas feed um, uh, rivers in India and in China whose summer flow from that summer melt um, feed hundreds of millions of people. And if we lose uh, the summer flow from those uh, rivers, we're going to have famines and starvation in India, and we're going to have the Chinese move on to the world food market in, in a massive uh, matter. There's going to be an impact uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, those of you that are interested in this, um, uh, Lester Brown of the Earth Policy Institute has probably written the most on this topic in an easy to read format. Um, as you probably already know, um, the North Pole is, uh, is disappearing. Um, how many of you, let me pause for a second, are here for the very first time? This is the first time you've attended one of these en energy seminars? Okay, a few of you, this may be news. Um, how many of you have read the policy summary for the uh, IPPC, the most recent report? Okay, so a few of you um, as, as well. Um, so those of you that are looking to nab a world's record and are on the swim team, um, the odds are good that you're going to have the opportunity to do this in the next decade. Um, we originally thought that uh, the northern ice wasn't going to disappear in the summer to 2070. It's clear now it's going to happen much sooner than that. I think the most optimistic or pessimistic estimate, uh, depending on who you read, is now 2012. Um, and so don your, uh, your wetsuit and be the first person to swim to the North Pole. Uh, 2005 surprised us. 2007 shocked us. What you see here um, is a NASA chart 
showing the minimum summer ice in 2005 and then what happened in 2007. I think almost no one anticipated this happening as quickly as it did. You see the North Pole. You see how close you could have gotten to the North Pole if you were a strong swimmer. Um, these are NASA satellite photographs. Um, they're a little harder to see, but they're almost more alarming um, because the angle of the photograph, you see how quickly the northern ice has deteriorated midsummer. Uh, more troubling to American uh, coastal dwellers is what is going on with the Greenland uh, glaciers. In the last 10 years, the Greenland ice, lot, ice uh, loss has, has doubled. Um, in just the last couple of weeks, there have been measurements um, showing the flow of glaciers in Greenland speeding up absolutely dramatically, um, really defying the laws of, uh, of physics in terms of how quickly some of these glaciers are moving. Um, uh, it isn't just that uh, they melt, uh, the melt water goes down to the bedrock and then it helps speed up the movement of the glaciers and so you get this synergistic effect that more melting ice begats more melting ice. Um, there are huge consequences to us if we lose the Greenland uh, ice uh, cap. We, uh, the oceans raise uh, about 20 feet, maybe 22 feet and that, of course, has a dramatic impact uh, not only on Bangladesh uh, and, and many of the uh, low-lying coastal areas um, uh, impacts uh, Venice, it goes out of existence, but it has a huge impact on us. So when? When? Of course, that's the $64,000 question. The last time the Arctic and the Antarctic was just 3 degrees Celsius warmer than today, it was about 125,000 years ago, sea levels rose by 20 feet. Um, we can debate how quickly this is going to happen, but we are absolutely on course, on speed, um, for a three degrees uh, rise in uh, temperature. So this is a little bit like speeding in the rain on balding tires. Time is your enemy. It's a little bit hard to predict how you're going to spin out. It's hard to predict what you're going to hit. But the outcome, if you drive fast enough, long enough, is not good. Um, perhaps a better analogy, at least one that my wife likes better, is if you are rolling an egg along a countertop in the kitchen, it's easily stopped, a little hard to predict its direction. Um, once it rolls off the edge, you need extremely quick reflexes to catch it. Uh, and once it hits the floor, it is beyond repair. And our climate, in a lot of ways, is somewhat like that. And our egg is nearing the edge of the counter or perhaps has already fallen off the edge of the counter. So the world's sending us a frightening message, both in the North Pole and Greenland, uh, with the methane uh, melt in Alaska and Siberia, and the beginnings of melt in the South Pole. So the last 10 years, we've not only seen a great deal of uh, the world's ice sheets either melting or beginning to melt, the ocean has become more acidic, summers are getting longer virtually everywhere, tropical diseases are moving north if you live in the northern hemisphere, and most climate scientists are troubled about the future of the world. Things have accelerated in the last 36 months. Um, we're seeing stronger hurricanes in the south. Uh, and over the next few decades, this trend is going to continue. We've seen uh, bigger fires in the west. This trend is going to continue. Uh, we're going to see droughts in America's heartland, um, the likes of which we haven't seen in recent decades. We are possibly, I think, one could begin to say, arguably, probably going to see stronger tornadoes, uh, much of this driven by the warming of the Atlantic waters. And we're going to begin to see just the beginnings of coastal flooding in America. Uh, if we act too slowly, we are going to lose parts of Florida. We're going to end up diking much of Manhattan. And we're going to irreparably damage American agriculture. And we will give to our children and grandchildren a very different world than we have today. So it's time that we got our act together and began to take action. So a little bit of background. Um, uh, if you were studying this uh, uh, topic in an emerging market country, um, this chart would be one of the lead off uh, graphs. You don't see it too often in American universities. Um, uh, Jim Hansen has started showing it. Um, this is the cumulative CO2 emissions uh, by society since the beginning of time. CO2, about half of it hangs around for several hundred years, so it's not an unreasonable thing um, to look at. And as you can see, America um, has some responsibility for taking leadership in this area. And if you combine America with Germany, the UK, and the rest of Europe, 
um, you can argue that the Western industrial societies um, have some responsibility to take leadership. When you look at this on a per capita basis, um, four nations stand out as being leaders. Um, the US, uh, Canada, Australia, and on the far right, you can see Saudi Arabia uh, in gray. Um, those four countries use um, uh, effectively more than twice as much CO2 or emit twice as much CO2 uh, as uh, the other societies. You see China there in red um, is uh, down a little bit more than a sixth of what the US does per capita. So let's talk about federal policy. Uh, if Ted Turner were, I heard him speak uh, last year, we ran him for president. Uh, he's already stated what uh, we need to do. Uh, we have to move at warp speed to stop using fossil fuels, and we should never build another coal-fired plant. I wish I could mimic his accent. He makes it sound powerful, logical, and simple. Uh, the problem is that it's much easier said than done. Um, I was once a true believer. Um, some of you are true believers and believe that conservation and renewables can save us. Um, those of you who have not seen An Inconvenient Truth um, should. Uh, it's a prophetic video. Uh, and in the closing scenes, Vice President Gore goes through a wedge analysis of how, with a combination of conservation and renewables, um, we can save the world. Um, the harsh reality is uh, they can't. Um, those of you that are true believers, or, you know, tune back in when we get through this section. Don't discount the entire presentation. But the reality is you can't get the arithmetic to add up. Um, from the proceedings of the National Academy, uh, we conclude that global warming of more than one degree relative to 2000 will constitute dangerous climate change. This is a true statement. No amount of conservation, plus solar, plus wind, plus nuclear, plus wave, can stop another one degree. We are on an a, uh, unalterable track to warm this climate by several degrees. Uh, Woods Hole, uh, Woods uh, Hole Research said uh, uh, scientific modeling suggests that the surface temperature will continue to increase far beyond uh, the 21st century, even if concentrations of greenhouse gases are stabilized. We are in dangerous ground. We're within one degree of being at the maximum temperature in the past million years. We, uh, if we're not careful, are going to return this to the land of the dinosaurs. So those of you who have looked at the numbers in the fourth assessment, I'm not going to take you through. It's a very complex chart. I didn't understand it the first six or seven times I read it. I'm still not sure um, that I understand this chart. But if you look very carefully at all of the projections, you don't see any half degrees, three quarters of a degree, nine tenths of a degree. All the projections start with about two degrees and go up to over six degrees. So you reach, I believe, the inescapable conclusion once you get over the shock of it that we're going to have to start testing some climate engineering. We already do a lot of climate engineering at the coal-fired power plant. Every tree we cut down um, uh, is a form of climate engineering. But we're going to have to start doing it on a larger scale in a more thoughtful, deliberate way. So um, those of you who were here last semester may have caught um, uh, uh, Ken Caldera, uh, Professor Dr. Caldera's um, talk. Um, I borrowed one of his charts with his permission. Uh, he hasn't seen what I did to it, but um, I've modified it slightly. But this is a projection at twice pre-industrial CO2. Um, this is at 560. Um, almost every projection shows us getting to 560. Um, probably not in the first half of the century, but certainly in the second half of the century. And as you can see, the areas that we are most concerned about, the Arctic ice, Greenland, Siberia, um, take the brunt of the temperature uh, uh, rise, and uh, Hawaii uh, gets off almost scot-free. Um, if we reduce the amount of sunlight uh, hitting the Earth by about 1.8%, 1, 1. you reverse almost all of that warming. So how do you do that? We have good models for how to do that. Um, every time we have a major uh, volcano, um, this is uh, Mount Pinatubo, um, it introduced small amounts of sulfates into the upper atmosphere. I'll talk about what small means in a moment. It reflects sunlight back into the space before the CO2 can, uh, uh, can capture the reflected infrared. Um, 
And there appear to be very few side effects. I'll talk more about that. You get more colorful sunsets. So with less sulfur than it would take to fill our new stadium, um, and this is really equivalent to about a week to two weeks of the sulfur that we already inject in the coal-fired power plant. So if you took two weeks of the sulfur that we inject into the lower atmosphere from coal-fired power plants and you injected it instead of into the lower atmosphere, into the upper atmosphere, um, you would buy yourself several decades of time to get our act together on coal and some other things that we need to do. So I've left the chart of the twice uh, pre-industrial CO2 in the, uh, in the upper half. And the lower half shows what happens if you do a test north of Anchorage. So if you uh, inject during the Arctic summer uh, uh, particulate sulfur uh, above the North Pole, and lo and behold, what happens is you mitigate the temperature rise in the Arctic uh, North in those areas of the world that we are most troubled about right now. Notice that Greenland, uh, the effect of the summer sun is almost completely mitigated, the North Pole, uh, most of Siberia. And if you look closely, you actually see that you get some mitigation uh, in other parts of the world, even uh, slight mitigation in the South Pole. Um, this is a very um, logical and rational thing for us to begin to test. If we don't test it, we're going to have to deploy it untested, which is scary. Um, and if we need to, it gives us the option of then deploying uh, a, a larger system worldwide. So reducing CO2 alone um, doesn't solve our immediate problem. If we want to keep the methane frozen, um, if we want to uh, save Greenland, save the North Pole, we're going to have to be a bit more proactive. Um, this is not a panacea. The ocean still gets acidic. Um, it isn't a license to continue to just uh, build coal-fired uh, power plants. It doesn't give us a get-out-of-jail-free card. It just buys us a little bit of breathing room to get our act together with the Chinese. And it does <coughs> mitigate the overall risk. A number of ways to do this. Um, I've ranked this. Um, just based on my understanding. Um, high altitude aerosols is clearly the front runner. Um, very little research going on in jet contrails. And jet contrails have a dramatic, significant, sustained impact on uh, our uh, uh, environment. It's uh, poorly researched. We clearly could do a better job of using jet contrails to our advantage. Man-made clouds of any type um, over areas of the uh, uh, world uh, when they're in perpetual sun, sun, sunshine, as in the Arctic summer, can have a significant and positive um, uh, impact. Other things have been proposed, artillery shells, balloons, airborne aluminum chaff, man-made snow, space-based mirrors, ground-based mirrors. All of these have uh, very high price tags associated with them, and we probably should work the budgets and do very limited field trials on all of them just to make sure that we really understand the, um, uh, what tools we have in our arsenal. Um, obviously, um, if we use this as a license to continue to produce CO2, um, we would be doing ourselves and the world and our children a great disservice. So federal policy, um, step number one, probably wouldn't put it as the foundation of the presidential campaign, but quietly we need to begin to plan and do some field testing of climate engineering in a thoughtful way. Step number two, um, we need to increase our R&D dollars. Um, uh, these are the earth instruments, what our plan is as we redeploy our assets onto the moon and to Mars. Um, this is silly. This makes no sense. We have a climate crisis here, and we should not um, be uh, shutting down JPL and the other uh, uh, programs that we have killed. Um, as the Wall Street Journal put it, um, the overall maps of Mars are about 250 times uh, more accurate than those of the ocean floor, but we've got something on the range of seven gigatons of methane frozen on the ocean floor that are troubling and we need a better handle on them. So we need to be measuring, modeling, absolutely everything. We need more space-based instruments. We need more ocean instruments. We need more Arctic instruments. We particularly need more instrumentation on the bottom of the, uh, uh, the Arctic ice where it comes in contact. 
um, with, with the earth. We need to be meticulously tracking the methane releases as they increase out of Siberia. We need more compute power. These are cheap tools. These are the smoke detectors and the CAT scans of the war on global warming. It is ridiculous to skimp on these things. A penny, sent here can, penny spent here can save us millions, tens of millions, and potentially billions uh, elsewhere. So um, I have divvied up a few of the projects in the R&D that need to be funded into the big and controversial and the boring and the mundane. Um, there are at least three strategies that have been proposed for carbon sequestration. Um, we need to be field testing all of them. Uh, we need to develop and test better technologies to save the polar ice caps. We need to manage our hurricanes much more effectively. We know how to downgrade the Category 5 hurricanes to Category 4 hurricanes. We should be intervening. We should be doing that. And we shouldn't let another Katrina happen. Uh, we uh, have warmed the Atlantic enough that we're going to see a series of them over the next few decades. We need to better prepare for it. Um, we need to do more research on nuclear. And um, there is some chance that we're going to lose one of the major Arctic, one of the major ocean currents. Uh, we have no idea how to restart one of these things. Um, if we lose one, it's going to dramatically change the world's climate. We need to begin to start thinking about how to restart a, uh, a, a major ocean current should one go south on us. As you flood the ocean with fresh water, and you change the ice and the temperature, you run the risk of just suddenly having the Atlantic current go haywire on us. A bunch of mundane things. Um, there's not enough going on. Um, we don't understand how to retrofit and upgrade existing housing stock. We don't understand how to build a really good thermostat. It's the most important computer in most homes. They're cheap. They're easy. Um, they do a very poor job. They produce staggering amounts of CO2. Um, we have very little money available for scale-ups. Um, we're going to have to get really good at fighting fires, and we're going to have to get better at fighting tropical diseases in non-tropical areas. All these things um, we should be scaling up. So increase R&D. We need a worldwide carbon tax. So <clears throat> this is a chart showing the CO2 that we are planning to release with the construction of coal-fired power plants over the next 25 years, and it exceeds all the CO2 released um, by oil in the last 250 years. We simply cannot let this happen. Um, a simple, gradually increasing CO2 fee, we can call it a fee if we don't want to call it a tax, start at $10 or $20 a ton, increase it a dollar a year, it makes coal non-competitive. Um, should be a universal tax, uh, should include deforestation and ag, the only thing should be exempt um, is uh, the gasoline used in consumer vehicles, and you have to handle that with DMV fees and congestion fees and other things. So this is a chart that shows a very conservative falling um, uh, prices of solar, starting at a little bit over 20 cents a kilowatt today. And uh, by mid-century, we get it under 10 cents. I actually think we're going to get it under 10 cents in the next 12 to 15 years, the very conservative assumptions. Um, this shows the black line is the wholesale price of electricity in China. Wholesale cost of producing electricity in China is under five cents a kilowatt today. And it shows what happens as you start out with a very small, modest uh, carbon tax and you increase it um, through the first half of the century. You make coal completely non-competitive. Um, you shut down the ability of uh, companies in the West to finance coal-fired power plants. You make it non-competitive in the East. It doesn't matter where you start the tax. You can start it at zero. You can start it at $20. Um, the curves still cross. So we have to increase prices on CO2 emission. Now, why not a cap and trade? Could do a cap and trade. Prices are unstable. Uh, there's price speculation. The rules are enormously complex. It's a lawyer full employment act. It's complex to administer. It's hard for utilities to plan. We could do it with enough lawyers, except that, as the Wall Street Journal says, developing economies have made it clear they're not about to be subject to emission caps. We need a system that works for two, the two major emitters, us and China. So we're going to eventually evolve to a simple worldwide carbon fee. Um, we need to lead the effort. 
uh, the EU and Japan need to join it, and China can choose to opt in or opt out. If you opt in, uh, you keep your own taxes, and you can deploy them as you wish. Uh, if you opt out, the trading partners will collect them for you and keep the fees. Very simple, great thing about CO2 taxes, they're extremely uh, simple to administer. Um, when you administer them at borders, you administer them just based on the value of the import and the percent of the economy that it represents. Uh, and then you take the pro rata of the CO2 tax for it. Those of you that are interested in it, we'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, later. Wow, wow. Um, this is the uh, DOE's um, latest uh, chart on CO2 emissions from fossil fuels in China. As you know, China has surpassed us as being the largest emitter in the world. Um, this is the G8 plus China CO2 per capita. Um, you can see um, they're still below France. France is, is, is uh, an anomaly because they use so much nuclear. Um, Italy is really um, probably a better uh, a benchmark. But China, China is well on the road to surpassing France. What happens to CO2 emissions in the world when China surpasses France? Um, if you look at the G8 uh, in China, you get a world where China very quickly dwarfs everyone else in terms of CO2 emissions. Um, this will permanently change the world. So we need a carbon tax that works for us in China. It needs to be simple. It needs to be fair. It needs to be predictable. Um, you need to be able to implement it at borders for non-compliant trading partners. You can start very slow. And it needs to be graduated in a way that it kills coal. So it is in the Chinese self-interest to do this. They are spending too much uh, on energy. They're spending way too much per unit of output. They don't like spending money with the Saudis any more than we do. It saves them money, it lowers their energy bill, and it will dramatically uh, reduce the pollution problem they have. Federal highway dollars. We need to, as we move forward, um, focus our highway dollars and the taxes that we collect from CO2 fees on mass transit. Um, we shouldn't care whether it's capital or operating funds, whether it's shuttle buses, pilots, or new. We ought to be allocating these dollars based on the grams of CO2 that are avoided. Um, and in particular, we need to encourage the states to levy their DM fees on vehicles based upon their CO2 footprint, not the purchase price of the vehicle. So if you drive a vehicle that gets 11 miles per gallon, it needs to be taxed at four times the level of a vehicle that gets 44 miles per gallon. Our Energy Star program, we need to strengthen it. We need to put it on steroids. Um, we spent about $4 billion last year on standby or trickle current or vampire current in the US. That's just obscene. That makes no sense for us to be doing. And of course, all of that resulted in CO2 being released. This is the profile for my house. Um, so this is what a house looks like once you've replaced the light bulbs with CFLs and once you've replaced the pool pumps, okay? Standby power takes up 15 to 20 percent of the electricity consumption. The idle PCs, these aren't the PCs left on at night, these aren't the PCs that are doing work, these are just the PCs when you stand up, you go to the bathroom, you answer the phone, uh, you go out to lunch and you don't turn your PC, in my household, that's 15% of our carbon footprint from electricity. Uh, and then a little bit less than three quarters of the electricity does real work, but a lot of that does real work in devices that are extremely inefficient. So we can make the existing rules mandatory, we can add more products, we can raise the bar, we can get standby power below one watt, we know how to do all these things, we can mandate and certify and track PCs, and we can have a staggering effect on the US. We can cut this electric profile of Western homes in half just if we take the best 10% of what we already have in the Energy Star program and we mandate that as a minimum. Building codes. So um, this is the German passive house, passive house standard versus US code, okay? US code today is seven times as inefficient uh, at heating and cooling a house as a well-proven, well-thought-out German standard. Almost all of the 
tools that you would need to do this in the US are not sold in the US. But we have an existence proof that you can build homes that are seven times as efficient as ours in terms of their carbon footprint. And that is without any solar panels, without any solar hot water. Um, those of you that are interested in this, you can uh, Google it. Uh, you can look it on Wikipedia. It's well described. Typical, and the conclusion you reach is we can reduce the carbon footprint of American housing and buildings by about 85%. Uh, an American home, a small home, easily spends $50,000 over the life of the home, and, and more typically $150,000 to $250,000 on heating and cooling if the home is built to the latest building code. This is just an obscene waste of money, um, and we know how to get this down uh, much, much lower than it is. We should phase it in, uh, and we should mandate it as federal policy. And finally, almost finally, last two items, uh, congestion taxes um, and mass transit. We love to drive. We love to drive. Um, these are the vehicle miles per licensed driver, and you can see they've gone up dramatically over the last few decades. Uh, we're not only driving more, we're, we're buying more vehicles and we're using uh, more fuel. We had a very um, brief um, uh, slowdown around 1980 when we uh, implemented the CAFE standards, um, but uh, the SUV exemption has allowed that to continue to go up. So we have good examples on how to do congestion fees. Uh, London, Stockholm, and Singapore have all implemented them. We can learn what they've done. There are certain cities that have extremely easy topologies in which to do this. San Francisco and New York are examples of that. Um, Charlotte would be an example of a city that has a very difficult topology to do it. We should start with the easy cities. Um, you've got to start with at least $10 a vehicle. You may have to take it up to, uh, to $20, and there's some commercial vehicles above that. Um, we ultimately will have to expand this to most of the congested uh, interstate. Um, we'll do this with RFID tags and other techniques, and we'll use proceeds to fund more mass transit. The alternative, of course, is to raise the price of gasoline. That turns out that that doesn't work as well, and it certainly gets a great deal more um, political fallout. So uh, it, it's easier to clean up the congestion and have our freeway system working and leave the price of gasoline alone. And finally, um, we really do need to tighten the regulations on SUV and light trucks. Um, we need to close the exemption for those uh, vehicles. Um, this graph um, uh, from the DOE shows what's happened since 1970 um, with light trucks and SUVs. As you may know, we don't, we don't call SUVs um, cars or passenger vehicles. We call them light trucks, and therefore we exempt them. And you can see, or we, we count them under a different set of rules, and you can see the explosion uh, in the number of uh, uh, millions of barrels a day they use. Uh, each gallon that's burnt by an SUV is about 20 pounds of CO2 that's emitted into the atmosphere. Um, less is better. Less is better, okay? The more miles, this is the, um, the CO2 footprint of a, a vehicle. Uh, an F-110 or a Suburban emit about 35 times their weight in CO2 over the life of the vehicle if you take it out of service at 120,000 miles. If it goes beyond 120,000 miles, it's obviously more than that. And you can see the hybrids are way down on the, uh, on the low end. What's not always well appreciated, most of you can visualize the prior chart, what isn't well appreciated is you reach a point of diminishing returns. That is, taking a Prius class vehicle that gets 45 miles per gallon and bumping it to 55 miles per gallon has almost no impact on the environment. Taking an SUV or a light truck that gets 15 <coughs> miles per gallon and bumping it to 20 or 25 has a huge impact. So the, the big gains are in the below 25 uh, miles per gallon vehicle. So whether you are a fan of the No Child Left Behind law or not, you should be a fan of the No Vehicle Left Behind program. Um, we should be targeting those vehicles that are the, the worst performers, the ones that are in the bottom quartile of their class, and we should be putting staggering regulatory pressure on them to get out of that part of the class. So, simple, eight-point, somewhat controversial, 
plan for the next president. Uh, we should start testing climate engineering. We should increase the R&D dollars that we're spending. Uh, we should proceed uh, with a worldwide carbon tax. If we want to call it cap and trade for a while. We can certainly engineer a cap and trade system to perfectly mimic uh, a, uh, a carbon fee. We just need to do it in a way that when we get to the point that we need to phase in China, um, that we've architected it in such a way that we can switch over to a carbon fee. Um, we need to start allocating federal dollars based on CO2 footprint. We need to strengthen the Energy Star program dramatically. Um, we need to tighten up our building codes dramatically. Um, we need to get cooking on congestion fees. And um, we need to get rid of the, the silliness of exempting uh, SUVs for soccer moms. So we need to begin to think of a CO2 first policy that as a presidential directive, anything that the federal government does, whether it's transportation expenditures, whether it's foreign aid, whether it's environmental impact reports, whether it's building codes, whether it's government, uh, governmental purchases, the number one criteria when you're trading off competing alternatives is what is the CO2 footprint of that action. Now, I know there's been some controversy about whether this is good for the economy. And I just want to take a moment to reiterate that efficiency is wealth created. The more efficient your economy is, the more wealth it creates. So I want to look at just a couple little simple examples. Um, this is the cost of powering um, uh, five items that I either own or have owned in recent years. A 75 watt halogen spot bought at the local Ace Hardware store, uh, my old pool pump, my daughter's VW Jetta, my wife's X. Uh, my current wife's ex-Chevy Suburban, um, <laughs> and a hypothetical small home in Menlo Park. No one's building small homes in Menlo Park, so I'd be embarrassed to tell you what it really is, but this is a hypothetical small home. These are staggeringly large numbers. I mean, this is an obscene amount of money to be taken out of the pocket of uh, average American uh, uh, families. We know how take all of this wasted money and cut it down by 75%. We know how to save American families and American businesses a staggering amount of money. We shouldn't be sending it to the Saudis. We shouldn't be exporting it to Venezuela. We should be spending this money. It's capital expenditures here, and we should be putting the money into our own economy. So we can build the kind of country that we want. We can cut the uh, CO2 footprint, the average American by 75%. We know how to mandate more efficient PCs. We know how to build uh, more efficient homes. We know how to get urban mass transit right. Uh, we know how to put bullet trains on the I-5 and the I-95 corridors. We know how to build more efficient cars. We need to do it. Now, we need to take action. Um, these are the three categories of scenarios from the most recent IPPC. Um, the low end of the scenarios are grim, the mid-range are catastrophic, and the high end are truly civilization threatening. We take temperatures up another six degrees this century and another who knows what next century. So how are we doing? Well, in the last 24 months, um, we are off the top of the charts. We are higher than high. We are emitting uh, more CO2 than the highest estimates. Um, it is accumulating faster than we thought, and it's doing more damage than expected. Sea levels will rise 80 to 115 feet. Sea level was 80 to 115 feet higher the last time the Earth was three degrees warmer than today. This is not the world we want. Our objective, our obsession, our passion should be to prevent this from happening. Um, so any of you that have a pet project that I've missed, um, drop me an email. I'd be glad to add it to my list. Um, unlike the IPPC moderators, I won't guarantee that I will give you a reasoned response. Um, but if I like the idea, I may include it in, uh, in my book. And I think we've got time for questions. Thank you very much.
must be somewhat odd to them or watching that as another potential problem in the sense that they are part of the source of a lot of problems, particularly oil, and coal is thought of as an alternative source. And, uh, you have taken a very strong stance against using coal as a substitute for uh, oil as a source of energy. But will we die off if we cut coal to zero and oil drops uh, as many expect? Uh, Ken Debbie's was here for wisdom uh, just a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I saw his presentation. Great. Well, then you can put in this concept my question, which is the bigger problem? We run out of energy and die from that, we run out of trouble, we pollute ourselves to death. Um, so we have many problems in, in the world. Um, but there are really, at the moment, only three that are civilization threatening, and they have different levels of probability. One is if we're, the, the world is hit by a large enough comet, that is a, uh, a, a or asteroid, um, that is a civilization threatening event. Probability is small, but it could happen. Um, the second is, is some form of a nuclear war or nuclear event. Um, could be civilization threatening. The most probable, however, and, and is not running out of oil, because we'll survive as a civilization very nicely if we run out of oil. No one could argue that we would be better off if we ran out of oil and certainly ran out of coal more quickly. Um, the third that's really civilization threatening um, is if we uh, build uh, another coal-fired power plant uh, a week or two a week for the next 50 years. We will, we will recreate the land of the dinosaurs. So um, there is going to be uh, an oil shortage, who knows when it's going to come. It may help, it may hurt a little bit, but the critical issue is cutting down our dependence on fossil fuels, getting efficient, um, and getting a carbon tax in place. Carbon tax disadvantages coal versus oil by two to one. So per unit of energy, coal emits um, twice as much CO2 as natural gas or oil. Um, so I'm not sure if exactly answered your, your question, other I guess then I'm dismissive of it. Um, if, if we run out of oil, great. If we don't run out of oil, great. What we've got to do is cut down on the amount of hydrocarbons that we're using at warp speed to uh, quote Ted Turner. Yeah. So when it comes to geoengineering, we need a global agreement. If you want to decrease the amount of solar God, energy. God, what a great question. Do we need global agreement? Well, of course not. Of course not. So do the Chinese have a global agreement? The Chinese are already emitting three or four or five times the amount of sulfur we're talking about. There's no global agreement there. So the rational thing for the city of Venice and the city of San Francisco and Stanford to do is just to go test it. Just to go test it, right? It's a pittance. It doesn't cost anything to do. It's, it's virtually free. It's a few 747 flights. Um, and there's, there's ample law. Who's going to sue you? Can you just imagine the Chinese taking Stanford to court for emitting one one thousandth the amount of sulfur that China already emits into the lower atmosphere, right? And if you were feeling guilty about it, you could just go to any one of a number of coal plants in the world and put a, a, pay to put a scrubber and say, we're going to scrub your sulfur We'll take it out. We're going to be a net zero sulfur emitter into the biosphere. So no, I don't think there's I don't think precedence in international law, nor do I think you're, I mean, if you were a Pacific island and you were going out of existence, how could anyone possibly argue that you as a sovereign state don't have the right to protect your land? How could you argue that Greenland doesn't? Anyway, so anyway, I'm not passionate about that topic, but yes. Yes, okay, so we, we ran an experiment accidentally um, with jet contrails. Um, so um, when we took the jet contrails out over North America, um, the results were quite, quite striking um, uh, in terms of the impact on, on, and that's why I have jet contrails as number two or number three on my list. Um, jet contrails already are a form of climate engineering that's much stronger, has had much bigger impact. Um, even the climate in Menlo Park um, certainly, um, the uh, climate in most Sierra ski resorts has been changed by the jet contrails coming in and out of the uh, uh, Northern California uh, terminal control area. 
So um, we, can, we can clearly manage jet contrails in a way that is more to our advantage than just letting it randomly happen. I see someone really wants to ask a question in the back. So you know, part of what drew me here is uh, your background in, in the venture capital firm. Yes. And you know, a lot of what you've been talking about is, is uh, our points that we hear a lot around here from a lot of different perspectives. And I'd really be curious to hear what kind of response you get when you give this kind of presentation. And I know you said you haven't given this particular one before, but, but you know, I assume you've at least had discussions within the venture capital world that you live in, which is so different from the world at least that I live in in academia here. Well, so I'd like to tell you. I'd all about that. I'd really yeah, so that. those of you who've been in Europe recently know um, that uh, climate, everyone that you run into um, gets that um, this is a very scary situation. Um, those of you who, who leave this campus and go around and you know, go home over Thanksgiving and start talking to people realize that a significant portion of um, uh, the American public really don't think this is a, uh, is a real issue. That's very scary. It was one of the motivators um, that uh, 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 got me to start writing a book was just to try and, 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 and focus on this. Um, so the venture capital community is focusing billions of dollars into things that are related to clean tech and, and energy efficiency. Um, and I'd like to tell you that, 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 that the good news is that the traditional alliance between conservative business, ag, Texas, red states, and ignoring reality um, has really been broken. There are a lot of business leaders in this country um, who've stood up and taken very courageous stands uh, that, uh, and including a lot of oil men, including one who funded the uh, Precourt uh, Institute here. So a lot of business leaders have stood up and, and have even caused the Republican Party to take notice on this. We've got a lot of people in ag, a lot of people that own uh, pickup trucks who, you know, they're going to be the victims of this and, and they get it. So there's a, an alliance that's non-traditional on environmental issues that's building here but there's still a huge number of people, both in the venture community and the business community, who really think this is in the category of snail darters. And you have an obligation to speak the truth when you run into them. I know a lot of you, you know, you go home and over Christmas or Thanksgiving and someone kind of is into it's nonsensical or, you know, it's just Al Gore. You have an obligation on this issue. I see people going, you know, rolling their eyes. They've got some of the same relatives I do. They're in-laws, right? They're not real relatives. <laughs> this is an issue on which we're called to speak the truth. This is an issue equivalent to what happened in Germany in the 30s. You, 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 the, the people that understand what's going on have to stand up and can't sit at a cocktail party and just ignore nonsense because it would be a little bit uncomfortable to confront someone. Yeah? Have you put together a budget and schedule for the eight-point That, that's right. Okay, so um, there are really two questions in there. One is we're already at, at one degree, and then how much does it cost? Um, let me just, um, uh, I don't want, I won't go through all eight points and cost them, but your question was particularly focused on uh, climate engineering. So there's been good work done here at Stanford by Ken Caldera, whose work I hopefully attributed when I was on his slide, but it, it attributed on the slides at the, um, at the Carnegie um, Institute. Um, right here on, on campus. And they've done, I think, a good job of, of costing it. Um, Lawrence um, uh, Livermore of uh, Berkeley has costed what it would take to do with artillery shells. You know, it eats their own. Um, and I'm told that artillery shells, while they'll get the job done nicely, you don't need spaceships, um, a, a, a airplane, or an artillery shell, or high altitude balloons are all capable of doing it. I'm told that artillery shells, by people who've looked at this, is a very expensive way of doing it. Um, and uh, one way to think about this is a 10 to 12 747s 
could do the entire planet. So, you know, th and this, these are very modest costs. If you look at just, for example, dealing with one Katrina, uh, and you could do a nice test with one or two plants. So the costs here are extremely modest compared to the cost of mitigation. Yeah. So for those of you that did, or who are you know, listening to this on iTunes and didn't hear the question, the question is, um, or the, the really statement is, that um, uh, it may be cheap to put sulfur into the upper atmosphere, but to hire enough Stanford grads to really understand the effect will be pricey. Um, and uh, that's a half truth. Uh, it, 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 yes, um, it, it will require more scientists. It will require more instrumentation. But on the scale of... D, of just dealing with ocean rise in Northern California, this is a pittance. Um, the state of California, seventh largest economy in the world, eighth largest economy in the world, could, could fund this and we wouldn't even notice it. I mean, it is a, it, I, I realize in terms of a departmental budget or most of our salaries, it's a lot of money. But in terms of the kinds of amounts of money that we're talking about, it's a, a very affordable um, thing to pilot and to test. And our choices are, if we don't pilot and test it and we don't do good science, we're going to deploy it with none of those things. Because when the Greenland ice sheet starts to collapse and the ocean starts to rise, we are going to do something and we will have no choices at that point. So one last question. Your I'll let you make the hard choices here. Well, but how about if we take two questions? Can we? Two short questions. Two short questions. Yes. Maybe this is a short element, but obviously, this, I think you must have given thought to where we find the political leadership and the world power to implement the eight point plan. And are there any comments that you can share with us on that? You know, I don't see that any candidates. I don't see it. Certainly, you know, we're here in April. So, so, the, so the, part of the question is, does anyone have the political uh, will to do this? And, you know, uh, you got to admit, who would have predicted um, that our Austrian bodybuilder would have, you know, eight or ten years ago, have taken, you know, have gotten religion and taken the stand that he had? So there, is, there, there, there was unanticipated hope for Arnold, and I would like to say that there's unanticipated hope for all of our presidential candidates. Um, you are hearing people call a carbon tax by another name. When someone says, I believe in cap and trade with a full auction, okay, that is, <laughs> I mean, the difference between a cap and trade with a full auction and a carbon tax, um, you know, one you need thousands of lawyers to administer and the other you just need a few tax collectors. But the, the mechanics of the two, and then when you add a floor on the trade and a ceiling on the trade, which you have to do, because uh, you can't have wildly fluctuating. And what you end up with at the end of the day, if you do a cap and trade system with a floor and with a ceiling and a full auction, is you end up with a carbon fee. So you're already hearing people, they can't use the tax word. But yes, last question. Yeah, one, just uh, as a bit of an add on, obviously, uh, you know, I'm, I wouldn't argue with what you present. I think, you know, it's a good, good plan. The question is, how are you going to get the legislators in this country to? Uh, some sort of consensus to do anything, considering you know how much progress they've made today. Well, if you look at the progress we've made in the state of California, with a Republican uh, a, a governor and a a law that requires that all legislatures legislators be inexperienced, so you got you got you got an amateur uh, 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 legislature and a um, and a bodybuilder. And, you know, we've done a lot better 
a lot better than any, well, maybe some of you, but any of, most people would have predicted on this. So I am I'm optimistic. I think we have an obligation to, to speak the truth. And there is a certain um, uh, compelling truth here. You know, as we watch these ice shelves collapse, people get more and more motivated to do something. And this train wreck is happening around us. It's going to become ever clearer over the next decade. And the number of policy, you know, levers that you have um, are, are limited. There is a prominent solution to this problem. You can have nonsensical solutions, but they won't work. It's a prominent solution. You've got to do these things. Um, thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.